Well, great. Well, hey, guys, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm just going to uh, start us off. Uh, we have uh, quite a few participants on right now, and I'm sure more people are going to be joining us in the next few minutes. And so uh, first things first, during this presentation, we're not going to save all the questions for the end. So if anybody online has any questions going in, I'm going to try to keep an eye on the questions icon and answer them as we go. That way it's less of a lecture and more of a conversation. I think it keeps things more fresh and interesting. But I'm Steve Easterby. I am the agronomy lead for Valent Biosciences Commercial Division through the country and the agronomist here on the western side of the United States. Uh, this topic of mine is one I've chosen because I think it's very interesting. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this in the near future, this concept, and you're going to see more university people, extension, crop advisors talking about it uh, for a couple of reasons I'll go over. So that's why I chose the topic. And with any of these webinars, it's always more interesting if we have a couple actual growers to set the webinar off and talk about the subject and get that infield experience with the topic. So today we have four growers that have joined us. Eric Morgan of Braga Farms in Monterey County, California, growing vegetables up there, a variety of those. We have Shane Ryan, uh, he, Shane, can you introduce yourself? I've never met you before, actually. And then Shay, also, I've never met. Uh, Shay, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, you bet. Um, from Mercer County, Illinois, uh, farm about 1,400 acres down there in some low, high clay river bottoms and, uh, everything from that to sand to, to some light timber soil, so. Oh, all right. Light sand, light sand. Okay. Thanks for joining us, Shay. Uh, hey, Zeus. Uh, he is a grower for Haas uh, up in Washington. They grow hops. And so, hey, Zeus has a, some more experience of a PNW crop and a, a new one for a lot of us here to experience. And the topic today we have is plant nutrition for natural disease resistance. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you guys to start things off. Um, first of all, what Eric, maybe to, can you tell us which crops that you, you know, just uh, got down the top five, maybe that you grow? So grow? yeah, broccoli, cauliflower, celery, iceberg, romaine, spring mix, spinach, fennel, cabbage. Yeah. So all the cool season annual vegetables. Okay. And we'll start off with you then, Eric. What are some of the pests? you deal with i know that those are near and dear to your heart and well known in california but they probably aren't as well known throughout the country so what are some of the pests you see on those crops so i think it, it kind of depends on what production system we're talking about on the production side we're 70 percent organic and 30 percent conventional um and so it's, it's going to vary i would say our, our biggest struggles in the organics is generally going to be aphid um when we start to talk about the conventional side you know, more so now we're struggling with ligus and thrips. Um, and those are obviously a problem in the organic production system as well. But um, in the last five years, we've had a harder time with those pests on the conventional side. Um, you get pin rot uh, on whether it's organic or conventional uh, brassicas. Well, 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 seems to be an issue too. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, to me, it's a little concerning diamondback as well. Um, dimeback moth on the brassicas, but to me, it's concerning in my tenure to see the amount of issues that we've had to deal with. And um, in the past, especially with diamondback, where we we had a bad problem in the late '90s, we got new materials, and we've been good for the last 20 years, and then all of a sudden, we're struggling again, big time with that pest. So, um, really concerned about materials moving forward. Um, in either production system and also just kind of aware of where we're going in California and the, 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 um, with DPR and what, what the pipeline is for new materials, um, looking for other options to continue to grow good quality crops. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Good. Um, before the next question, I'll let's, let's go over it. I would like to hear the other pass in the, with these other growers here. Hey Zeus, what are the top? you pass that you guys deal with in hops 
Um, yeah, in hops, we have a few different ones. Um, so outdoor, we mainly deal with uh, mites. And then this year, well, not just this year, but uh, the past four or five years, we've seen an increase in, um, I would say, more like moth and worm like pests. So we had diamondback as well. Um, and that could be because maybe we're using brassicas in our cover crop as well. But we did have some diamondback uh, this year. Um, in the greenhouse setting, because we also have greenhouses, uh, we deal with a few different ones. Every now and then we get aphids, um, but they're not so much of a problem. Um, like, uh, for example, potato leaf hopper, those small ones. Um, we have a bunch of fungus gnats, um, thrips as well, which people say that thrips don't do much damage on hops. And, and I could agree to that. But, you know, if you have a high population, high density of it, I think they can weaken your plant for sure, um, especially if you have other other uh pests out there like potato leaf hoppers and so on right yeah they can get to big numbers and then start to have an effect especially if the crop the plant is weak from something else right mm -hmm. shay how about yourself you guys see any uh pest issues out there uh yeah um on the soybean side um just the normal um aphids are fairly normal um but a lot japanese beetles has been a big one that depending on the year has gotten more and more that you really need to keep up on um as far as the corn side the european corn borer first and second generation is generally um most of our issues um we uh, haven't had too much pressure for rootworm uh cut worm some, but a lot of the um, main things we focus on is European corn borer uh, on the corn side. Um, okay. Disease Diseases, they're um, on the soybeans, there's a lot less sudden death I've seen and a lot more white mold getting into the area. So that's kind of been a top concern for us on the soybean side. Okay, interesting. Well, we'll... Uh... Now we'll go down to the next question. Then now we have an idea of which pest you guys are dealing with. I'll start off with Eric again. My question is, have you noticed a difference in infection severity from those pests like aphids, thrips, pin rot on plants that are more vigorous versus ones that are weaker? Or is it about the same level of infection uh, throughout the field? So... I wouldn't use vigorous as a, a the word. I would use healthy. Um, and so, if we're gonna if we're gonna go there, we're gonna go there. But um, what we've seen is that healthy crops seem do resist insects and disease better, and we've had success in that in that area for sure. So, um, I, I I don't want to use the word vigor um, because vigor doesn't necessarily equal a, a healthy crop, um, and so that's the weeds that I'm into right now, um, is that Very point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A healthy plant, which I'm sure we'll be discussing. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how about, uh, yourself, Jesus, have you seen, you mentioned mites, um, you know, when I used to walk potato fields in Washington, I would, and you, I would see a lot more aphids on the edges of the pivot circle where the plants got less water and because they were using water to deliver nutrition, probably less water and nutrition, but I always find a lot more aphids on those lighter green, weaker plants. Do you see the same thing with hops and mites maybe throughout the field if uh, uh, less healthy plants, do they have a higher mite percentage or worse? moth or, or worm-like damage or what have you seen out there yeah on average um so your weaker hills you could say or binds um are definitely going to have higher um like a, a higher count of mites or even uh they'll have more strikes as far as powdery mildew um so usually either if it's not getting enough water or if it's waterlogged um either of those can cause uh, the plant to enter, I guess you could say to get stressed out a little bit. And I'm sure that stress uh, attracts mice in one way or another. Yeah. Great. Uh, good point. Uh, 
That's a good point on the water aspect too. That would make me like that. Shay, how about yourself? Anything with the uh, aphids or white mold? Um, any difference you see in healthier versus less healthy crops and infection severity? Um, yeah, I think the disease will it will always pop up in your um, you know more unhealthy um, spots. But as far as um, getting worse or seeing worse, um, white mold a little bit. But the pests, it just seems like it depends on the kind of year you're going to have, whether we've seen. I haven't seen too many aphids um, in the past few years and pretty small Japanese beetles in the past couple of years. But um, that white mold, we just try to we run 30 inch rows, keep them wide and uh, let the air go through and spots who've had problems maybe run corn on corn a couple more years before we switch to the beans but just change the environment a little bit but yeah uh, um yeah it's as far as pests go um it's generally not I, i'm sure the the weaker stands it definitely would it would hit first but generally yeah. it's just kind of all over the board where they're going to pop up as far as insect pests. Gotcha. And, and starting with you, my last question, my last question here, in your area, which may not ha uh, have as much of scrutiny and regulation as we experienced in the West, but still there is some, do you, are you losing any pesticide tools? Have you recently or expect to in the future or anything useful? Um, so far, so good. We have not, um, had any any issues with that as far as uh, not being able to use what we want to use and uh, right. supply chain issues with roundup and stuff through covid we you know everybody kind of switched their spraying program a little bit adjusted it for that but um as, as far as that goes it's hasn't we haven't seen any hard regulations to that would really impede us to have to do something different Wow, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. It's not the not the case everywhere. Um, as our European fellow farmers could probably tell you. Oh my, hey, yeah. Hey Zeus, what about yourself? Uh have you guys uh, all these these pests, do you have everything you need? Uh, you guys are effective tools? Yeah, yeah, there's actually a lot. Um, since we do ship to EU a lot and uh, they have slightly different MRL regulations um, down there. So, yeah, we've seen a, a few of our uh, miticides gone away, a few fungicides like, um, for example, Top Guard. There's certain varieties we can't use it on. Um, and then we got other miticides like, um, which one is, I think, Apollo, if I'm not mistaken, we can't use that one either. Yeah, there's there's a few. And then every year they're coming out with more, uh, I guess, data and testing. And uh, yeah, it's it's limiting us a lot on what we can use outdoor wise. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense, especially with the MRLs in Europe, in Europe that can add another layer of things. Eric, how about yourself? You guys uh, ever seen any increase in regulations or? or well, I think so. I mean, we've got the water board, which is, you know, limiting how much nitrogen we can apply. You know, we have in California, this, the roadmap to sustainable pest management, which looks like, you know, they want us to use primarily biologicals. We've lost curb and gotten it back with some restrictions and changes to, uh, you know, pre-harvest interval. We've lost Dactol. We've lost chlorpyrifos. We've lost diaznon. You know, we've lost a number of materials in neonicotinoid regulations changed as of the first of this year. Um, and, and really, you know, I, it's, it's what's going to happen is we, as we continue to lose chemistries, it's going to put more pressure back on the chemistries that we do have. And we already do have resistance. You know, we talked about diamondback moth and we've got four or five very effective materials or were effective and none of them work anymore. Um, and so, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that, um, and maintain production to feed people? So regulation is a big part of where I allocate my time in, in trying to really understand where things are going. Um, but I'm not super optimistic about the standard ag input model. 
in the next 20 years. Um, there's just been too many changes and um, the agendas that are present. I mean, there was, I saw something that the Farm Bureau released is that the California Department of Pesticide Regulation is trying to hire and get the budget for another 117 employees. Um, so I imagine that that will have a big impact on, you know, how, how we're regulated with products. Right. Yeah. So uh, between the three of you, it's a, it's a very, uh, very good range there from, from Shay. Uh, not too much worrying about and Hey Zeus, not horrible, but got some things. And then Eric in California, like this, this is everything is going. We'll down. figure it out. We'll figure it out for them and then we'll show them what to do. So that, <laughs> right. You're going to be the, the guinea pig. Yeah. Either that or they'll <laughs> starve. There won't be any more broccoli. So it'll be one or the other. We'll figure it out or we won't have broccoli. So. Right. Well, great guys. Um, really appreciate you joining us. If you can stick around uh, for this next hour, that'd be great. I'm sure people have questions at the end. They'd be happy to have you guys answer. If not, that's all right too. So, but uh, really appreciate you joining us and getting us going. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks you guys. Thanks. Yep. Thank guys. you. Well, now we've got a, uh, some answers here and some input from growers around the country to start us off. I think that's a good start to this talk of plant nutrition for natural disease resistance. Uh, this is by Valen Biosciences, and I'm going to tell you now who we are as Valen Biosciences. Now, you may have heard of them in the field uh, because they have been making or we have been making products sold through Valen USA often, and those products are often PGR based and also some BT as well, fermentation products, um, retain, proton, dipel. These are the products Valent Biosciences is creating and sold through Valent USA. And now, as of this past year, Valent Biosciences has its own business unit because we have found that, that not everybody should sell everything within a company. We'll have some division of Valent USA. We'll continue to focus on a lot of those existing PGRs and pest control products. Valent Biosciences will focus on biostimulants as another tool in the toolbox for growers to use and, and bionutrition as well. And so we are uh, leveraging over 60 years of experience in the biostimulant sector of creating those previous uh, biostimulants you are known that you know already and leveraging that R&D workhorse for this new business unit. Here's where we are as far as our center of operations, the research centers in Libertyville, Illinois, very slick facility there, extensive research capabilities and scientists. Uh, in Osage, there is a manufacturing and fermentation facility, one of the largest fermentation facilities in the world. That's where BT and, and G, gibberellic acid and other products are fermented and created. Grants Pass, that's where Mycorrhizae Applications is headquartered. Pace International, uh, anyone in the apple industry knows about Pace. And we have different facilities as well, as, the, as well as our headquarters, which is in Japan. And that is Sumitomo Chemical is the, the headquarters and owner. So now moving on to our, our talk here, plant nutrition is part of natural disease resistance. We already talked about this point here, current fungicide and insecticide landscape, regulations are becoming more strict, especially in the Western United States and in Europe and other places in the world. It is more difficult for manufacturers to register new AI ingredients. You can ask any of your chemical reps about how much harder it is to get a new AI to market, both in time and cost. Pesticides are encountering resistance because we have fewer AIs, fewer, and so we're using the same ones over and over. And what do pests do? They become more resistant to those. Um, the newer chemistries have to be more sustainable to even pass regulation. They have to have a lot higher, uh, higher requirements for environmental and human safety that they did in the past. This often means that they will be less effective in some part. Um, and, and so it's going to be not that we're not going to use pesticides, we definitely are going to use them, but it's going to have to be more of an all-encompassing approach to be able to use those effectively. Those cultural practices, as Shay talked about, wider wider rows for more airflow and, and other aspects. And then consumers demand for fewer pesticides. You, you see it all the time in social media and your cousins and that Thanksgiving. 
having to explain to them more and more about what pesticides do and why we need them, but they want few, fewer of them. They think it's a, a bad word often. And then farms are getting larger, growers are getting fewer, unfortunately. And, and so what also we're seeing is that these investment companies that own the land, they have uh, requests from the landowners and these these boards to farm a certain way. And oftentimes that's gonna be a more sustainable way. And so there's a lot of demands, a lot of demands on the farming industry to grow food with fewer or softer pesticides now and into the future. And so what are the implications of that for farming and food supply as a whole? And how are we gonna deal with that? Our current pest control methods are basically focused on this, some cultural practices, which are extremely important. And then also this seed and spray it mentality. It's, we're gonna, a pest is gonna pop up and we're going to use a pesticide to, to deal with it. With fungicides with and bactericides, often they're preventative and curative, uh, hopefully mainly preventative. And then insecticides are generally curative. If you see it, yeah, we wanna kill it. And viruses, we have no pest control method generally, uh, besides Rogaine and clean nursery stock. But what if, and this is the question for this webinar, what if there's a way to strengthen a plant's natural defense system with nutrition or biostimulants and make these applications more successful? And now we have another tool to successfully implement an IPM, uh, Integrated Pest Management Program. So to see if that is a, a endeavor worth taking, that it, if there's promise to that, we're gonna cover some background of how plants actually defend themselves against pathogens. Because it's not a very, a very often spoken about topic I have experienced is plant defense systems, plant immune systems. You're familiar with your own immune system and how we can improve it. During COVID, everybody was talking about it all the time, how they can improve their immune system. And plants also have an immune system. They have evolved for millennia to defend themselves against pathogen attack. So those plants back in the day, a million, uh, a billion years ago, that were able to fight off bacteria or fungus or insects, survived to pass on their genes. And so the plants that we have today have those facilities in place to defend themselves. And I think as we need to improve our pest practices to rely on the pesticides we have now, we, there needs to be a greater knowledge of those, of that system and how we can support it. So there are three main strategies are physical, very simple there, uh, microbial, actually soil microbes is what I'm talking about mainly, and perhaps also microbes on the, the leaf surface. And then finally, biochemical defense systems. So what is physical? Physical defense system, very, very straightforward. It is the physical aspects of the plant itself. And so that could be the shape of the leaf, how thick that waxy cuticle is. Uh, is the leaf cupped or flat or large or small? All of these have helped evolve to maximize photosynthesis and grow in their environment and also to um, fight against whatever pathogens that plant evolved with. And so surface properties, as I said, thicker wax, more hair, that can help against some insects, fibers, that sort of thing. Very straightforward there with the physical aspect. Now, microbes, soil microbes, a little more talk about this recently. Very interesting stuff. The soil microbiology is pivotal in assisting the plant defense against pathogen attack. So why? Why would it's microbes, which aren't even inside the plant, help a plant? Well, they actually produce enzymes in the soil that can attack the pathogen. You know, you know in your crops what soil-borne pathogens exist. Some of those microbes can actually produce enzymes that attack them and outcompete them. So they're fighting for that those root exudates of the plant, those carbon sources, water, nutrients. A better, a healthier microbiology is going to help you uh, resist that plant resist pathogen infection. They can even steal iron away from other uh, from pest species. And a point here I wanted to make this last one, Ava adequate micronutrient availability is important to the growth of soil biology. This isn't looked at very often. We're often thinking, we get a soil test, we're thinking about the growth of our plant, but microbes are 
live creatures and every living creature on this earth needs kind of the same building blocks we do. They need access to nitrogen, iron, potassium, phosphorus. So if you have a deficiency, not only will it affect your plant, it's also going to affect the soil microbes who apparently we need to help uh, start up that defense system and compete with soil pathogens. And then finally, um, this defense system strategy, which the main one I'm going to be talking about today is the biochemical. And doing my research, I was, I was able to divide this strategy into three main areas. The first is an oxidative burst. And the, the symbol I use for the oxidative bur burst is a uh, pulse gun or pulse rifle, as you can see from an image of, of uh, alien there to the right. And that is when a plant can actually release a localized burst of reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide or some peroxidase to deal with a pathogen infection. So a, a pathogen infects a plant cell and bam, that plant can re, uh, release that hydrogen peroxide to destroy it or slow it down. Another thing they can do, pretty cool, plants can create essentially a force field. I think that image there is from like a Star Wars movie. And these are cell wall appositions. They're fortified defense structures. So again, a pathogen affects, bam, a plant can produce that force field. And then finally, plant defense metabolites. And my, my picture there is with sheep dogs. Uh, we have a lot of grazing of sheep throughout California. You can drive through and it's always fun for my daughter to try to find the sheep dogs in those sheep. They're pretty well hidden. And they're there to protect the sheep from wolves and mountain lions and whatever. And plants can produce their own version of sheep dogs. So when they get infected, they'll produce these secondary metabolites that go out there and fight that pathogen infection. So think of white blood cells uh, for humans. So plants can, uh, can do that as well. Now, a key point here is all those things I talked about, the physical defense, the microbial and biochemical, they're all reliant upon sufficient mineral nutrition. And this is a quote here to the right that I found that I really like. The success of pests and pathogens to colonize a host plant or crop is directly related to the nutrition status of the host plant. Uh, a first point here, and this kind of plays into Eric's comment earlier about vigor and excess vigor, plant, a pest love excessive nitrogen. Now, the disclaimer here is pests also love deficient nitrogen, and so that's not the play you'd want to make, they, but they love excessive nitrogen. And so throughout the literature and research, we have found whether it is in apples, bananas, uh, corn, et cetera, when you have excess nitrogen and, and overly high vigor, you do see higher degree of pest infection of whether it is leaf borer, uh, moths, apple, um, mites, or powdery mildew. So that is not one that more is better as far as pest uh, disease resistance. Phosphorus. Phosphorus can generally help sufficient and balanced phosphorus. Uh, found a good study there on uh, Asian soybean rust. And this is a great point here in a summary of maybe this whole presentation. They found that fungicides controlled the soybean rust, but phosphorus nutrition improved that control. So phosphorus helped control the pest. It wasn't that phosphorus was acting upon the pest itself, but the researchers found there was significantly better control of soybean rust when phosphorus was added to that fungicide to control it. Um, and a key note here too is that excess phosphorus, in another trial, excessive phosphorus can have the opposite effect, thereby increasing sudden death in soybeans. And so there's a big point here to be made about balance. Not too little and not too much, but certainly enough that the plant is well fed. And maybe the sweet spot is this, and, uh, and still another trial, researchers found that moderate applications of phosphorus with some phosphorus solubilizing microbes increased yield more than large applications of P alone. So instead of putting on a huge application of phosphorus, um, adding a little, slightly lower rate with phosphorus solubilizing microbes, that increased yield more 
And then hopefully that also can prevent this excess phosphorus effect that can apparently um, increase pest pressure. So I think that's kind of the sweet spot, at least in a couple of these studies. Calcium, this other macronutrient. A, uh, we know that calcium is an essential part of cell walls, healthy cell walls. That's sort of the physical defense strategy there. And also the biochemical, calcium is used as a signaling molecule. So that pathogen infects the plant, it needs calcium to then send that signal and initiate this systemic acquired resistance response and this network of rapid signal transmission so that even if uh, a, something starts chomping away at this leaf on one side of the plant, over here on this other leaf, it knows like, hey, let's start setting, let's start setting out some hydrogen peroxide. Let's beef up our immune system because we've got a pest that's chomping away and it could come to this leaf next. Calcium sending that signal to that other leaf to get that plant prepped for that attack. So calcium also very essential. Potassium, uh, I've seen a lot of studies on higher leaf tissue potassium levels helping to decrease mite and aphid pressure. And so the researchers, not sure why that happened, would start to discuss, you know, why would potass higher potassium help that? And generally what I've seen, the, the conclusion is that higher potassium levels generally result in a higher concentration of car complex carbohydrates in the tissue sap. And that's actually less appealing to insects than simple sugars that are more uh, accessible and readily fed upon. And that's that's uh, currently the, the working theory of why this is occurring. Um, also, potassium is necessary for another physical defense mechanism, strength and rigidity of cells. So calcium is essential for those that cell wall creation. Potassium, as we know, essential for rigidity and strength of cells. When you have deficient potassium, you'll see more lodging oftentimes in wheat or triticale or barley. And so that, that's a physical defense strategy as well as creating more complex carbohydrates. So here we got some examples of cotton, wheat, mustard, and these different studies that have shown a, a decrease in the population of aphids and green bug because of potassium um, applications. Here's another one here, this is on strawberries showing a variety of different uh, pick, picking times here at the start of the season and late, uh, late session, and then two different varieties of strawberries. And you can see the darker gray color is calcium sulfate applications, and the green is potassium sulfate, and then the, the lighter gray is water control. And this is showing the density of mites uh, that is two spotted spider mites on the strawberries during these different phases. And it's a very consistent response. When adding potassium sulfate or calcium sulfate sprays, we see it, they see a lower density of the mites on these different strawberries at the early, late season and, and, different, and different varieties. And something you should probably point out too is in strawberries, when we see response from something, it's, it's generally not because the strawberries were deficient in that nutrient. Strawberries have some of the soil's highest infertility of any that I have seen because they, they dump that on. They are generally never, well, I don't want to say never, but they are often very sufficient in all nutrients because of how much fertilizer is added to strawberry fields. So even so, adding some foliar potassium seemed to help in this case. Uh, here's a, you don't have to read through all of this. I'll just highlight a couple of them here, but this was a great study. And if you're interested in this subject, that that uh, paper there I have cited at the bottom of the, the slide is a great start for it. And this is a, they, re, they went through a lot of different studies and, and tried to pick out where nutrient applications and researchers have found were connected to lower or higher disease severity. And so, for instance, we can look at flag smut in wheat and phosphorus, um, in that case, increase the severity of disease. And so that may be pointed out to where that was too much phosphorus, whereas in uh, powdery mildew and cucumber, phosphorus reduced the disease severity. 
And then with uh, calcium, calcium, typically we see a reduction in disease severity, like in Phytophthora stem rod in soybeans. Calcium decreased the disease severity in, in soybeans there. And in corn, magnesium, corn stunt, reduced the disease severity. And so these are some of the points that aren't being brought up too often. And when a grower has an issue with some of these pests, and they're trying a lot of pesticides and maybe not having great success. And hey, there's some research out there that says some of these different practices and nutrients may actually help the plant resist or recover from those. Maybe uh, give those a shot as well and see if, if something can happen. Um, <clears throat> so very interesting things there. And now we'll move on to the micronutrients. Um, I won't put all of these in there, but these are the sort of the things that people are poking into and trying to figure out what is the mode of action of, of these, what is, how is this mineral nutrient acting within the plant? What's it actually doing? Zinc, uh, helping that reactive oxygen species, uh, detoxification and enhancement in pathogen activity, uh, acting against that pathogen. Iron, actually catalyzing reactive oxygen species against the pathogen, as well as uh, silicon. You guys uh, may have been hearing about that more often used in, in agriculture, strengthening the cell wall, and another of other modes of action. Um, for instance, zinc here, I picked this one out, oxidative stress resistance, and some disease resistant crops can actually produce these zinc finger proteins where zinc is required to stabilize its structure. And these are key into some of these disease resistant crops I have here like wheat, potatoes, rice, tobacco, tomato, they can create these finger proteins that help make them resistant to disease. And then at other crops in general, just across the board, zinc is helping to activate, uh, activate enzymes that produce defense metabolites. So again, those sheep dogs, zinc is needed to activate that, that enzyme to produce those defense metabolites to fight off pathogens. And here's a, a sort of a hypothetical or theoretical explanation of what how plants can use zinc. Uh, and this is really interesting. So we take a plant that's zinc deficient. What happens? It's got a poor zinc diet. You got a zinc deficiency. You just get eaten. You get eaten by a herbivore. Whereas uh, if a plant low in zinc, another thing it can do, some plants do, is sequester the zinc. So now we've got a, a low supply of zinc out there it can actually induce a zinc deficiency of the pathogen. So now the pathogen is, is zinc deficient. Now this is gonna be plant species dependent, but again, it's, it's trying to deal with the fact that it's low zinc. What we want is to have sufficient zinc, obviously. And, and when a plant has high zinc, some species can do different things. One is a zinc efflux. And so it's actually exuding zinc to create a toxic zinc environment to the pathogens, which, which then negatively impacts them and can kill them or, or disrupt them. Also, uh, hyperaccumulation of zinc. So again, that can create uh, zinc toxicity and organic defenses. And so this is exuding zinc and this is a plant hyperaccumulating it, which is very interesting because we look at zinc and our tissue tests and saying, hey, this is you know what the university say, all we need, because then we don't see deficiency symptoms. If it is a plant species that does this has this biochemical defense strategy, even if it is just borderline deficient, will it be able to hyperaccumulate zinc and then fight off these pathogens? I don't know. I would guess not. That would have to be some advanced study, but I would imagine that uh, it would have a hard time doing it if it was borderline zinc sufficient. Um, more here showing the importance of zinc. High zinc exposure can cause lower fecundity of uh, reduced growth and higher mortality of insect bodies and eggs. So this is a good fitness uh, graph here to show you how zinc plays between plants and the pathogen. Pathogens like a lower concentration of metals typically. Down here is a sweet spot. You can see the, the pathogen. This is when he's healthy and happy right here at a lower metal, metal concentration. Whereas a plant generally likes a higher concentration of zinc. A little bit higher here, that's where plants healthy and happy. But you can see that's where the pathogen drops off. So this is where we want to live. Not right here. Right here is plants unhappy, pathogens are so happy. And over here, plants are happy, 
pathogens are unhappy. Higher metal, metal concentration. So again, we talk about a zinc deficiency, it's gonna reduce photosynthesis or internode length. I think also it has to be taken into account deficient in zinc, we are now more susceptible to pathogen infection. I think that should be added on to the assessment of any crop advisor agronomist going forward. Iron, how does iron play in? Uh, really cool thing here, we're gonna talk about the force fields. So plants, uh, they can redistribute iron, move it around to activate their cellular, cellular defenses. And so that free iron outside the cell creates hydrogen peroxide and what scientists call cell wall appositions or CWAs in some species. This can happen as early as three hours after inoculation. So plant gets hit by powdery mildew within three hours that plant is creating this force field to fight off the attack. So with powdery mildew and wheat, for instance, that's always associated with the accumulation of iron. So wheat, if you have an issue with powdery mildew, I would say you would definitely not want to have a deficiency in iron. And I would think that you would focus on having a, a very good supply of that. If you had an issue with powdery mildew and wheat every year, I would say there should be a foliar iron application before the typical outset of that disease every year because of this. Uh, here's a cool picture of that actually. So the blue staining is where iron is, is a uh, high concentration of iron is. And this uh, right here, this is the powdery mildew canidium. And this is the uh, sort of like their, sort of like their straw where they're sucking up some of that plant juice, that leaf tissue, that leaf sap. This uh, the powdery mildew sends this out, and it's going to suck up the the sap from the wheat cell. So what does the wheat plant do? It creates this force field here, and it's an accumulation of iron that's helping to create that and and make hydrogen peroxide to fight off that pathogen effect. Um, so really really neat there. And iron's uh, wheat's not the only one that that does that here. You can see that. Uh, corn does this, barley does this, oat, sorghum, millet. They all can create these force fields to fight off some of this fungal infection. So uh, pretty neat stuff there as well. Manganese. Manganese is used to make phenolic compounds for defense metabolites. So thinking about those sheepdogs, a plant needs sufficient manganese to create those compounds. Some plants can act and also do that hyperaccumulation strategy where they are just beefing up their manganese, which is a heavy, which is a heavy metal. And you can see here a little drunk or dead caterpillar that went and chomped on this, uh, this, this leaf that was very high in manganese. Soybeans, uh, wheat, oats, and barley are especially vulnerable to manganese shortages. And uh, this is interesting here too, talking about creating those reactive oxygen species, that, that pulse rifle defense strategy. This, this study here found that seed treatments with different microelements, micronutrients, significantly increased peroxidase activity in sorghum leaves compared with untreated ones. So just adding a little bit of a seed treatment that had some micronutrients in it helped increase that reactive oxygen species, the peroxidase to fight off pathogens. Uh, yes, we got a our first question here. You can get a copy of the slides at the presentation. Lots of good info, but complex to remember. Absolutely. Uh, here's a quick summary uh, from that same, same review of studies that have been done for the past few decades on crops and nutrients and, and pathogens. And uh, looking here, uh, I didn't know this one here. I used to be a part of farming wine grapes and you type a dieback is a very common disease in wine grapes. And it looked like some researchers found that boron applications increase resistance to that you type a dieback. And in wheat, uh, zinc application reduced the disease infection of fusarium head blight. And in tomatoes, uh, copper applications reduce the disease in, uh, incidence. Uh, that may have been uh, elemental copper, um, is what I would imagine, but maybe not. 
uh, manganese, got common, common scab, very common pathogen and uh, to deal with in potatoes. Looks like a manganese application that reduces disease incidence. So these are the sorts of things that if I was a grower of any of these crops, I'd like to tease out of the research and start playing around with to incorporate into a pest control strategy, especially as going forward, we may have uh, fewer pest control products to work with or products that need a little bit of a more inclusive program to work effectively. So in summary here, all defense strategies, those physical aspects, the microbial, soil microbes, and biochemical, they're reliant upon sufficient mineral nutrition. So, uh, and again, the success of pests and pathogens to colonize a host plant is directly related to the nutrition status of that host plant. And so I'd like to take a, I think there should be some sort of sea change or sea addition to how we look at nutrition and plant health and integrated pest management. Our classic nutrition focus points, what you've learned in school and plant science class, getting your CCA license. Why do we have nutrition? Why do we focus on fertility? We want to improve photosynthesis. We want to improve pollination success. We need larger leaves, a bigger canopy. We want to increase carbohydrate and sugar formation. And all these things we're doing, why? So we can have a better yield and better quality. And when people in the currently, the mentality is our, uh, our plant immune system focus points, if we're going to add on to why we use nutrition, I think it should be because nutrition helps improve a crop's ability to fight off initial fungal and bacterial infections. So we use nutrition to help improve a crop's ability to resist uh, insect feeding and improve the crop's ability to recover from pest infection. And so the implications of this is again, ability to use softer, more sustainable chemistries, uh, chemistries more effectively. Also have we get to achieve a lower pest infection on the crop and finally, a higher yield and quality of crop. So we can have a healthier plant, healthier plant that is not stressed out, produces more yield. So we can sell that crop for, for more money. Again, a, a point here I want to make here, it, it should be, I mean, I think it's intuitive, but we're not using the, this. None of this nutrition is, is acting directly on the plant. That's what... When you apply sulfur dust or elemental copper like coside to prevent or kill a pathogen, that is using an element, a mineral, as a pesticide. When you're feeding a plant, when you're providing the iron it needs for its immune system to work properly, that is a fertilizer application used to create a healthier plant. So two different, two different aspects there, um, sulfur, copper, those are acting as elemental. They're not being absorbed by the plant. They're killing a pathogen on the surface of it. Using potassium, phosphorus, et cetera, to your advantage by making a healthier crop, that is improving its own defense system. Um, two, different, two different approaches there, obviously, I would think, but it's worth mentioning. So here's this cause of effect, waterfall flow. We have proper nutrient applications. That re, of, of a balanced fertilizer program. We then have healthier plants that have better disease resistance. Now we have a stronger IPM program, increased yield and quality, and an end result, happy consumers, consumers and partners. So we made those investment companies that own the land happy, consumers happy, regulators happy. It's in a, a easier world to live in. For the future. And so how and so now of course I have to mention some of the tools that we have in Valent Biosciences to actually support this process of nutrition for plant defense systems and how we are looking at playing into that. And if you were going to if you were going to remember one thing about Valent Biosciences nutrition products, it is that they're utilizing biomimicry. This is a concept that a lot of people have leveraged to create inventive products. Velcro was created by a guy who was looking at burrs on his dog's fur and thought, man, that's cool. What? A, how could I use that? He created Velcro. 
some of these uh, wind machines out there are actually putting bumps on the edges of them because they found that humpback whales, turns out, didn't have these weird growths on their fins for no reason. It actually helped to decrease drag through the water. And then the classic example of Mike Phelps and other swimsuits using that that was uh, scales on their swimsuits instead of a smooth swimsuit because it cut through the water better based on shark scales that uh, do the same thing. And that's that's what uh, Valent Biosciences, the nutritional products that we have, is based on based on nature and uh, working within that system. And I'll I'll get into that in a second here, but uh, these are a few of the biostimulants and nutrition products that we have. We talked about zinc, manganese, and boron being important to the plant defense system. The go-to one we have is our microblend foliar zinc, manganese, boron. And again, with the uh, proper zinc and manganese nutrition, a plant can produce defense metabolites effectively, uh, which results in a plant that has higher disease resistance when it is well-fed and uh, better pollination success. We also have Symbato. That is a symbiotic beneficial fungi that you can use to inoculate plant roots. They're gonna increase the uptake of phosphorus. As I mentioned before in that, in that one study, Researchers found that a huge dose of phosphorus would did not lead to as big of a yield as a moderate dose of phosphorus with a phosphorus um, solubilizing bacteria, similar in, in, in mode of action to Symbato. Symbato is a beneficial fungi, and these fungi that associate with plant roots do a great job of increasing phosphorus uptake. So that is lending to that balanced nutritional approach. So we're not relying on one source completely, but a more comprehensive effort to supply the plant with the nutrition that it needs. And some of these studies, uh, just in a seed treatment, which you can use to inoculate the plants with this uh, beneficial fungi, increased phosphorus uptake, and which resulted in an 8% yield increase when no phosphorus was applied, but even when phosphorus was applied, it still was a 4% yield increase. So a good balance approach there. And then transit foliar, this is our organic matter derived biostimulant, which increases nutrient uptake and mobility. And I think that's important here because sometimes it's hard for a plant to get up certain nutrients from the soil and, and it needs an extra boost, uh, something that can push that plant to utilize the most of its fertilizer and the nutrients native to that soil and move them through the plant. So we look to biostimulants to help us achieve that. The one that we have is, is transit foliar, as well as buffering against stress. And both Symbato and Transit, um, earlier one of the growers, um, I think it was Shane mentioned that they see more incidents of the, the pest pressure on plants that are waterlogged or don't have enough water. That's a stress, and that's not a nutritional aspect. That's just an irrigation or, or water accessibility, and that's definitely a thing. Plants that are weaker and uh, uh, do not have enough water or are waterlogged can be more susceptible to pathogen infection. One of the things that these biostimulants can do is help buffer against that, both too much water and too little. So VEDO is helping extend the plant's root system, so now it has more access to water throughout the year. And so it's not going to experience those drought-like symptoms as much and thus have a healthier plant. And transit foliar helps when uh, we've seen with waterlogged soils as well. So plant when it's cold and wet, seedlings that have been inoculated with transit from the beginning seem to have a better start. So again, creating a healthier plant with biostimulants. Uh, let's see, you got a couple of questions here. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. I'm going to go over those here in a second. Perfect. Uh, soybeans, uh, this is also the mycorrhizal fungi, Simvedo. Um, So this was talking about the phosphorus applications. When 0% of phosphorus was applied, Simvedo was still able to achieve a higher yield close to or higher than when 100% of phosphorus was applied. But in either case, 0% phosphorus or 100% phosphorus, still that higher yield. 
pause that study I mentioned a second ago. And same thing with potatoes here. Um, they looked at no phosphorus, 50% or 100% phosphorus. And generally I've heard out there that some people think that mycorrhizae fungi aren't gonna work if you use phosphorus fertilizer. And that generally is not true. Now you see the difference is, is less. If you have no phosphorus, you're gonna have a larger increase with using mycorrhizae fungi. Um, but there still is an increase in yield, even with 100% of the phosphorus program. And some of these trials that we've seen, this one was in four different sites on potatoes. A transit technology, this is our other biostimulant here. It is derived from fresh organic matter. And so one of the questions was, how does that relate to fulvic and humic? Fulvic and humic is derived from mined coal deep in the earth. That is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, million years old. And what happened when that, that layer of coal is created, water was running through it. It was leaching out some of these plant active compounds. And so the founders of transit, they wanted to go in and capture that stuff that leached out as well as the things that are in humic and fulvic. So that's what we've, we, that's how we're making transit. We're going to organic matter, soil organic matter that is ag bio, um, that is fresh now, extracting the plant active compounds from that and creating this transit product. And so the highly active bioactive compounds, uh, the plant already knows them. It, they already exist in the soil, just in higher densities in other areas. And we don't just, you know, draw it out and stick it in a jug, our scientists are actually choosing the compounds that we have found are most plant active and using those for the, the final batch. Let's see if I answered that question. Um, so there is no seaweed mixed in with transit, although a number of our familiar products do include seaweed. Um, and as far as tissue analysis, recommended levels, that's an, a, a good point. Um, tissue analysis and recommended levels for crop to manage the nutrients or sap analysis. I think either are great. I know sap has a fantastic play though as well. You get to see what is moving to your old and, and young tissues. When you take a, a standard tissue analysis, you're just getting what's in there right now. <clears throat> but when you use a sap analysis, you're taking old and young. So you actually get a sort of future view of what's to come because when the plant is growing, that young tissue is going to be drawing up nutrients. That's where the sink is. It's going to be before the crops created, it's going to be that young tissue. And if a plant is borderline deficient or it's 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 running low, it's going to start sucking things out of the older leaves. And you don't know that that's upcoming unless you do the sap analysis. You could take a regular tissue analysis and think everything's fine. But when you can see a big discrepancy between young and old, you know that your plant is soon to be deficient, so you can get ahead of it. And that's when you see deficiency or find one in a tissue and a crop in season, the yield draw may have already happened. So you've already missed a window you could have prevented. So that's why SAP, it is a little bit more expensive, it's a little more effort. I think it gives good, better info though. Um, so, but, but both are a great uh, employee to use. In transit and how we're helping out nutrient use efficiency, we have many different studies on a whole variety of crops throughout the world of improving nutrient use efficiency. And how is why is transit doing this? Well, these these polyphenols that we are putting on the, the plant, either as a foliar, a seed treatment, or through the soil, they're acting inside the plant to decrease nutrient binding and help nutrients move to where they need to be as well as increasing nutrient uptake through more vigorous root growth, as well as better uh, root exudation that actually helps to mine the nutrients from the soil. And so that's how we see uh, higher nitrogen use efficiency, phosphorus, zinc, and boron, uh, manganese, calcium. Across the board, we have seen through crop destruction and actually measuring the amount of nutrients in the crop taken off, or in leaf sap or tissue analysis, uh, generally a much higher nutrient use efficiency when using transit biostimulant. And then the, the final thing about our products I wanted to mention, the, the biomimicry aspect. It's, it's a pretty neat way of formulating products. We're not using any synthetic chelates. 
but our products are chelated. Both the foliar and soil products are chelated, but we are trying to use things that are recognized by the plant. So first to get through the cuticle, we're using enhanced sugars to neutralize the charge. Plant leaves have a negative charge. Our micronutrients have a positive charge. So they're gonna repel at the surface. When you use these enhanced sugars we use, you can neutralize the charge and help it pass through the, uh, the cuticle. Organic acids are produced by the plant naturally to move nutrients within the plant system. Zinc, iron, it's not just moving naked inside the plant. It, it's generally associated with something, whether it's an amino acid or an organic acid to move through the plant. So to increase mobility, we are using organic acids, a variety of them in our foliars to enhance that, as well as transit the biostimulant. So not only do we have the sugars, we have organic acids, transit biostimulant, and then a number of our foliars include seaweed as well. So you really have a, a whole package in, in one jug with this, with this nutrition. Um, finally, a, a low pH, you, generally a spray tank does better with a, a lower pH around six and as well as the activity of, of other things in your spray tank. And so uh, we do have, those are our acidic products. And our soil products as well, utilizing that biomimicry model. Plants actually exude organic acids from their roots to solubilize and suck up in their liquid diet, those nutrients. We're working within that same system. That's how we are chelating our micronutrients. Uh, we are using organic acids with them. So now they are protected from the soil environment. They're taken up by the plant easily and they're, they're mimicking that system. So they're actually beneficial and, and loved by soil microbiology, which feeds on organic acids. So we use that same system as a more uh, trying to mimic nature because nature does it, does it best. Again, these are our soils. Are, we generally have uh, biostimulants we are focusing on, like the mycorrhizae fungi and transit for our uh, expanding root system and increasing nutrient uptake and stress mitigation, as well as transit foliar seed treatment and soil for stress mitigation and nutrient use efficiency. And then we have a line of biomutrition products, which use some of those things I talked about, enhanced sugars, seaweed, organic acid, chelates, and they all include transit within them. Uh, now we'll get to the questions here. And uh, so we're leaving this here. You can see my phone number and my email at the bottom of this slide. And if you scan this, you can connect with us. Uh, I'm going to provide the, the scan for the CCA credit here as well, so you can get your CCA a credit. And then finally, we have another, uh, a bunch of um, crop advisors, technical sales managers through our company throughout the, the country that can help get you using any of these biostimulants and nutrition products to help build a healthier plant. And the, so demo trials are available, scan this QR code, and then we can link you up with the right person to try try something like this out. And so we would be looking at an untreated check versus our or your agronomist recommendations on products and monitoring the health of your crop. So I'd love to walk through that process with you. Uh, let's see, uh, <clears throat> another question here. Uh, is it organic? Yes, we do have an organic version of Simvedo mycorrhizae fungi, as well as Transit itself has an organic version. We do have an organic zinc product as well. <clears throat> and if you guys have any questions also, if any of the growers are still on there, um, happy to, happy to uh, see if they can connect with them as well. Another question here, do we work with natural enemies? Um, 
No, we do not. As far I think that what you mean is beneficial insects and release of those. No, we do not uh, employ any of those uh, natural uh, any beneficial insects. Uh, another uh, couple of last questions here. My soil tests typically come back with sufficient levels of all nutrients. Why would I worry about fertilizer applications? That's a great question. Uh, things all look uh, hunky dory in your soil test. Why worry about it? Um, because plants can't always access everything that isn't in the soil when it comes back with some um, ammonium acetate extraction. I think that that needs to be paired with tissue tests as well. Because if you have high pH or low pH or high organic matter, or really high carbonate, that could be tying up some of your micronutrients and the plant may not have access to those. And so it's not going to photosynthesize as effectively, produce as high of a yield, and it's also not going to fight off pathogens as well also. So that's why a tissue test is generally need to be paired with that soil test. Another question, this is a good one. Why, what should the timing be for nutrients to support plant disease resistance? Um, as far as timing, I, it, you want that plant to be as healthy as possible before infection. I know when I'm going into cold season, I'm taking all my vitamins and zinc. I'm trying to eat healthy and, and work out just so my immune system is prepped and ready for any potential flu or cough or cold that my kid or I'm going to get um, in, pu in public transportation. So I think the earlier, the better for these nutrition applications to make sure it's available to, to the plant. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that covers our, our number of questions that have come through. We're really happy to have you guys join us. And we are going to send you the QR code to scan so you can get credit for uh, your CCA license. And if you have any uh, questions, or if you don't get that, or, or want access to some of these slides or presentations or citations, please uh, scan that QR code and let us know, or email me myself down there at the bottom of the screen.